Uh, so uh, I'm an acupuncture and Chinese medicine practitioner. Um, I offer the services of acupuncture and moxibustion and coupling. So moxibustion is a burning of the mugwort herb that's used in conjunction with the acupuncture. Um, oh. Very important part of it. Mugwort. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I also do Chinese remedial massage, Chinese nice. herbal formula, and Chinese herbs. I didn't know you did the massage as well. Yeah, that's yes. awesome. Yeah, it's called Tweena, and it's a it's push pull, and it's kind of it's. Um, I use it in conjunction with the acupuncture, depending on if, especially if I'm treating like musculoskeletal conditions, um, and also. Something that I'm really passionate about is a patient-centered remedial dietary therapy. Each patient that comes in through the door is it's a it's a new story, and mm. everyone's gets treated individually. So there's yeah. no sort of blanket, um, you know, uh, resolution for each case. So even if two people come in with a headache, it can be a completely different reason why they've got the headache, and so we have to go through the whole diagnostic process yeah. mm. in right. order to determine wh where that's coming from, um, and. Mm. As well, um, that includes lifestyle counselling as well, um, just to find out where the gaps mm, are. That's what important, might be isn't it? Yeah. See what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Otherwise, yeah, whatever we do in the clinic, they can be undoing that outside of the clinic. Yeah. So it's good to sort of talk about how these things mm. have come about in the first place. And uh, we also do cosmetic acupuncture as well. Oh, what's that? Uh, so yeah, using needles in the face, sometimes up to a hundred mm -hmm. needles, to make us tiny, younger. Yeah, so it brings collagen, fibrinogen back into mm -hmm. the, brings blood into the area, heals the skin. Wow. Uh, so that's another another exciting part of acupuncture that mm -hmm. we can utilize. I suppose that's like why women go, or women and men really go to have a facial because all the massage sort of gets the blood flow and doesn't it sort of help Correct. with yeah. the glow of the skin. Yeah. Yeah, very nice. Um, now, you just mentioned like headaches, and I just wondered, like, do a lot of people get headaches? Is that like a common thing? It can be. So especially at the change of the season, it's really common to get yeah. headaches. You know, um, what we call the, an invasion of wind. So the, the back of the neck becomes very sensitive and uh, can be quite painful, and we'll get headaches down the side of the, the, side of the mm. head. Um, you know, people with stomach problems might get headaches at the front of the head. Um, People that drink a lot might get headaches that are coming up into the, the top of their head and, and red eyes and all that kind of thing. So there's just many different reasons for headaches. Most of the time it's tension, um, but yeah, there's def different types of headaches mm. that you can get. Um, That's interesting that you said that like um, if people have stomach issues, they can get a headache at mm -hmm. the front. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's really? because the stomach channel um, does actually uh, go all the way from eyes all the way down to the bottom of the feet to sort of second toe so you know when we talk about channels the body has 12 to 14 main major channels and then lots of collateral it's like little rivers and then little streams mm. that come out of that so um, when we work with acupuncture we're using points on those channels in order to you know, stimulate either um, moving what we call stagnation of chi and blood mm. in the channels so um, I like to always use that analogy of water and streams mm. and making sure that that water is running clear and that there's no muddiness because when there's muddiness we get we get blockages, we get embankments, mm. so, so to say, um, and landslides if you yeah. can kind of imagine it in that way where things just get blocked and things aren't running smoothly. Yeah. And that's when we experience pain and experience discomfort and physiological um, disruptions you know, that prevent the body from running at its optimal. I found it, find it fascinating, acupuncture and the needles and how you know where to put it exactly. How do you know where to put it? <laughs> well, it uh, takes a good four years of, mm. of training. So it's a four year degree, um, it's a health science degree that we do. And um, you know, I've, I've been really blessed to, to study with some amazing teachers. You know, Brent is re a teacher um, who actually passed away recently. So mm. <clears throat> yeah, it's, um, just takes time and you and you use your fingertips and you feel, over time you feel yeah there's there's a book mm. um book location of all the points so there's 360 main points and then there's a lot of extra points on top of that most practitioners tend to circulate about 100 to 300 points in their practice um but we also have what's known as usher points which are points that are we find by palpation so palpation is the touching of the skin um in the muscular area um to be able to you know, find changes in the skin, find dryness, find lumps, um, and mm. so we find extra points in that regard as well. Um, yeah, because we've got lumps and bumps, haven't we? Like you feel 
when you're getting a massage and then they hit a spot and there's a knot or something what do they call it like a, a yeah, knot i think in, in massage they, yeah. they refer to it as a knot yeah that's um you know in chinese medicine we would call that a stagnation a stagnation really? of qi so things aren't flowing correctly and so there's a build up there's a backup kind of like a traffic jam i guess mm. Mm. So, so it's not normal to have that uh, it's common it's common but, but we don't want it but we don't, we don't want it, it. Yeah. so little lumps and bumps yeah. they can start off really benign and then things like tumors there's just like a further exasperation of a lump or a bump that's kind of been stagnating for a very long time and then add things like yeah. heat to it and toxins and that's how we get unwell mm. so how does food play a role in this so like health generally from a chinese medicine perspective from an east asian dietary therapy perspective all foods have a thermal property and an energetic property. So when we eat things like lots of greens, they're really mm. cooling and cleansing, um, but we sometimes we need to bead and cleanse at different times of the year. And then things like chili, red meat, mm. alcohol, they're really heating. So that can dry the fluids in the body and that can cause what we call a blood stagnation or blood dryness or dryness in the lungs or, um, you know, that kind of thing. Right. So we adjust, you know, I talk to people about what they're eating and what their favourite foods are. Mm -hmm. Often a lot of their favourite foods are the ones that are causing them harm, so we sort of need to give them yeah. alternatives um, and, yeah, talk to them about the thermal properties of food and, and how their diet is affecting their well-being. Mm -hmm. What about coffee and tea? We always see, you know, these health sort of practitioners saying that not to have tea and coffee or not to have too much tea and coffee because it stops the absorption of iron and the uptake of uh, vitamins and minerals from our fruits and veg so yeah. what, what's a how, how do they look at it within Chinese medicine they well, don't really drink coffee do they in that part of the world it's not recommended but I think I, I would agree that myself and a lot of other practitioners do a lot of practitioners choose not to it's quite heating mm. and drying is it and one heating of the things and drying it's quite coffee. heating and drying yeah and, and it stimulates the nervous system so it, um, it can make us feel ungrounded and, and erratic right. in the way that we think. Um, mainly it's the heating aspect. I thought coffee was meant to calm us. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, it does. Uh, you know how people say, um, oh, sorry, not calm us, but you know in the, in the morning people say, go to have a coffee to just chill out a bit, have a coffee. You know, it's the whole... Um, yeah, it's a stimulant. Yeah. But it is a stimulant. It's a whole, I think I'm thinking of like you have a coffee, you think you have a coffee to relax with friends, have a coffee and chill out, but it does stimulate the adrenals, doesn't it? It does, yeah. <laughs> so we've got to remember that. Not so to have too again, many. it depends on the person. Yeah. So there's some people that um, they may have a very slow, so everyone is born with a different constitution. Mm. And then um, depending on their family and depending on their, their culture and the kinds of foods that they eat, um, that's why different people will have different what we call disharmony in the body mm. that can lead to disease um so if someone's got a real sluggish kind of way about them then coffee can be really beneficial for that person you know you wouldn't recommend having multiple cups yeah. of coffee a day but a sluggish nature it can mm. really benefit from having a little bit of coffee from time to time and it has antioxidants and things like that so there's always a trade-off um it mainly that you know from a chinese women's from a Chinese medicine perspective, we would recommend from the age of 35, especially for women, to start preparing for menopause. So that's the sort of time when we start to think, what are the things that are heating? What are the things that are drying? What are, what are gonna cause problems down the line? So then we start counseling based on the level, of, you know, the, the stage of, of where that person is at the time. So with menopause, the body heats up. Is that what you said? Sorry about heating. Yeah, it heats up, it, it dries, so, um, the, the natural air conditioning in the body starts to not work as mm. well as it used to. Uh, and so we need to find ways of pacifying that, of cooling the body down, um, not by having anything icy from the fridge or anything like that, but the kinds of foods that we have and more soups and more steams yeah. things and things Light that are, things. Just more, more um, things that contain moisture. So um, moisture is best absorbed from foods like fruits and vegetables and soups as opposed to just drinking and guzzling water, which just tends to put pressure on the kidneys and doesn't sort of just go straight through you. Really? So sipping water throughout the day is great. But if you imagine that that concept of the of the Japanese tea ceremony, you're sipping your ten mils every every ten minutes, that kind of thing. So it's allowing the body to assimilate that water rather than just That's interesting. Yeah. Because yeah. people do, don't they? They think, oh, you have know, to drink you eight glasses yeah. of water a day. Yeah. And people saying they get up and they skull two or three glasses of water. So you think that's not good? It just goes straight through? Uh, it's just 
you, you can have and you can have warm, and it's also good to have warmer water or warm or water that's um, mm. body temperature. So um, I think before we went on air, we were just talking about how about raw foods, and and so in Chinese medicine, we we don't recommend lots and lots of raw foods and lots and lots of foods because they can be quite cold in nature. So if the person's already got a heat condition, it might be a good idea to have some raw food. Yeah. Um, mm. But a lot of the time, you know, the body has to use its own energy to create a 38 degree soup in the body. So um, if that person's already low on energy, then having too much raw stuff is going to actually deplete them a little bit more. And yeah, yeah. Um, they're not going to absorb that in mm. the intestine in the best way. Mm. Okay. All right. Um, so would you say as a general comment that a sort of like warm, gentle, sort of mild soups is, is good for the human body as a general, or can you not say generally because it's different for everyone? Because you know you hear when people are sick that you're, we're always told have a nice warm soup with a bit of lemon and some nice veggies, like when people are say, sick and healthy, really. Uh, I think in my opinion, soups are always a great idea, yeah. especially now going into autumn and winter, especially in the evening. You know, one of the things that I talk to about that's funny, intermittent fasting is really common. Yeah. Um, and I always recommend to people if they do want to do that, and it's better to skip dinner than to skip breakfast. Skip dinner. Yeah. So um, we're wanting to have a really healthy appetite in the morning. That's a sign mm, of good health. So great. So um, yeah. having lighter things in the evening contributes to a better sleep, which contributes to feeling better in the morning. Mm. Uh, so I, I recommend that people eat the bulk of their food at breakfast and lunch and then if they are on, you know, wanting to have weight management or um, if they're wanting to lose weight or just manage their weight, then definitely having lighter meals in the evening is a better mm. idea. Um, so the body can detox mm. on the sleep then? Yeah, and we use acupuncture and herbs to support those processes as well. So I do a lot okay. of you know, lifestyle counselling um, and, and recommend regular acupuncture to mm. tune the body. That's how we sort of describe it. So reminding the body mm. of its natural blueprint that it came in with and all the, the mm. mental um, disturbances and the lifestyle disturbances that create disharmony, the acupuncture helps to remind yeah. the body where it was supposed to go. Mm. So what herbs are good? What herbs are as, good? As a general, you know how people have got little basil on their windowsill or rosemary or sage, like could, could we say as a general what a, th you know, parsley that cleans the blood, you know, three or four, you know, for listeners thinking, oh, what little pot plants can I have inside for herbs? So, so in Chinese medicine, we we almost always use herbs in the form of a formula. Right. So liquid. In a formula, in the sense that it's there will be say up four four to twelve herbs that are used together um, okay, in concert. I see. Uh, so we don't usually recommend individual herbs per se, um, but we can add. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that I recommend is you know peppermint's really good because it yeah. it's it works on the liver system and it helps to pacify and calm the liver and help. The liver is responsible for distributing the chi or distributing the energy throughout the body all the way to the extremities. So um, mm. if there's one herb that I would recommend that people have you know, in a tea form, then it's probably peppermint. Peppermint and ginger. Ginger is not a really mm. great one that you start start the digestive fire in the morning. And so having a slice of ginger with some hot water is, is a, as a benign and healthy thing to have that's not um, going to put you out of balance necessarily. Mm. Nice. Like we hear ginger, lemon, honey. You like that tea too? Yes, yeah. it's delicious. It's really good for, especially at this time of the year when the body's cleansing. So springtime, autumn time, a time when the body naturally cleanses. So when we have those kind of soups, uh, those kind of teas, um, it helps to bring a lot of phlegm out of the body and it helps us to, you know, it, oh, what we call nice. expectorate, to get rid of all of that ex extra pathological fluid that we don't need as well. So spring and autumn is when we clean. clean. Mm. So what's winter and summer? So summer is a good time to um, eat more lightly and um, enjoy ourselves more. Um, and in winter, it's a really good time to then have earlier nights, sleep in a little bit more, and then we're use, using warm, nourishing foods to, to build back up in order to then in the spring to come out again um, refreshed and rested. In summer, yeah. we use a lot of our energy going out and mm. enjoying and socialising. Um, you know, it's sort of a natural thing mm. if you think about it. You know, that in winter, we tend to you know read our books and mm. you know, stay warm, stay together, 
Mm. I liked, um, we were just uh, chatting before we started and you said that it's a seasonal thing, you know, the food we eat changes every season and we like to see people every three months because our bodies change from season to season. We've got different needs. That's right. So now we're going into autumn. So um, the, the organs that are associated with autumn are the lung and the large intestine. The, lung, the, the motion of the lung is grief, so oftentimes we're processing a lot of that kind of thing. And the large intestine, for obvious reasons, to do with letting go. And so we're always wanting to support those organs as best as we can. They're both susceptible to dryness, so that's another reason why I would recommend more wet foods and stews and soups and things that are going to nourish that. You know, things like the steamed vegetables, steamed fruits mm. with a little bit of nice. honey, that's always nice for the lungs as well. Yeah. Um, to prepare um, the lung and the kidney then into a win for a good win for a result in the kidney and the bladder as well. Mm. <laughs> so well, what did you say like you said lungs is associated with grief? Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So if you imagine when we're having an, a, an episode of extreme grief, <laughs> yeah. we can't breathe properly. And mm. so that's kind of how that relates. So it taxes the lungs when we're when we're grieving and yeah. we're processing difficult emotions yeah mm. and you hear people saying when they lose their loved one that they feel the hollowness in their their chest area right. like from their throat to the the mid what do you call this area the mid the diaphragm the diaphragm yeah, yeah. like there's that pain yeah. in the chest mm -hmm. that heaviness. Uh -huh. so that's that's a really good example of what we would call lung two stagnation any kind of pain can be then translated as stagnation it's not something's not moving correctly it's interesting mm. Yeah, I think there was a lady who wrote a book on all the different parts of the body and different e emotional issues uh, affect different parts of the body. Oh, what was her name? Oh, I forget the name. That was a coloured book. Louise Hay? Yeah, Louise Hay. Yeah. You, you... I've seen that book. Mm. Um, my father was really ill when I was young, and so he had that book at home, and he was looking at all the different associations. I'm not really sure where that tradition comes from, but right. it's, it's definitely interesting to have a look at. Yeah, um, which is interesting. Affirmations and things mm. that they have. Yeah. So I think she went through a lot as a youngster, didn't mm -hmm. she? She yeah. had a really traumatic yeah. childhood and then was on the journey of healing. And she realised that, you know, hope and wellness is an inside job. Yeah. So she's trying to remind people that the responsibility for their own health. You can't you can't buy health. You can only mm. take the guidance, you can only take the information. Mm. And it's not something that we can pay for, unfortunately, yeah. no matter how much money we've got. Mm. <laughs> And it is a holistic experience, isn't it? Like body, mind, soul, to do with everything, you know, our emotions, our food, our physical, physicality. Are we moving? Are we exercising, walking? What are we doing? You know, some people push themselves too much. They go to the gym and do weights and they push their body to an uncomfortable, I think, out of balance um, state. You know, I've heard a lot of people say the best form of exercise is just like 20 minutes walking a day and not even pushing it, but mm -hmm. just being... Just walking normally, just go for a 20 minute walk. It's, but it's one of the best things to move the links because the lymph glands are underneath the armpits and then in the groin. So when you just go on a brisk walk, that's moving everything because the lymphatic system doesn't have a pump like the heart, like the, like the cardiovascular system. So we actually need to move, oh, interesting. move our arms and legs in order to, to process and pump the lymph around the body. Right. And that's another example of for wanting things to just flow clearly. And so that's why lots of sitting going on. Um, mm. They say sitting is the new smoking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> too much sitting can cause stagnation in the body and lead to depression and things like that yeah. as well. So is that why when people are in hospital and they've had surgery and they can't move, they put the little, or they get the physiotherapist there and they move the legs or they get right. those things that they put on the feet to pump. Well, what's it called? It's like the, uh, yeah, um, someone was in hospital recently. I visited them and they said the nurse put something on there from their ankle to the knee and it was like, it was... Uh, Helping to stimulate the yeah, it was some fluid some pulses or mm -hmm. something making like the muscles move mm -hmm. to get the lymph flowing. Mm -hmm. You I'm, know, I'm telling them to it. move the feet around and move the up arms and hands just to yeah, moving flow. all the joints is really important. You imagine lying in a bed for like a week. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that yeah. would affect the energy. Sore. Yeah, you start to get sore patches like mm. a lot of us have been down with the flu or COVID or things. Yeah, and you start to feel really sore mm. after laying down for too long. Yeah, you get moving. So your your clinic is called Dancing Crane Acupuncture. So yeah, that's the, the business name that I use. Um, I practice out of two different clinics. So one's in 237 Hot Street. It's called Shen Adelaide. Um, and yeah, you can book there um, by going to www.shenadelaide.com. 
and I also work on Wednesdays at Sterling Hollywood Hotel um, mm-hmm. and you can book there by um, just calling the reception on 8339-4322. Mm. Okay, so a- as I um, read at the beginning of my program, you've got an interest in women's health, autoimmune um, issues, um, skeletal, uh, autism, trauma, substance abuse support, and is there anything else I've missed just for someone listening if they're thinking okay I can come to you to talk to you about this or that uh, who were some of your clients that you you sort of treat let's say what sort of issues yeah so all of those things that we've just um, listed um, I um, have an interest in chronic degenerative diseases and being able to sort of um, reverse engineer like how that person got to that mm. point in the first way uh, a lot of the time um, you can't really separate the mind from the body and so uh, mental patterns definitely plays a part in the development of disease. So obviously there's genetics, but there's also, I don't know if you've heard of the concept of epigenetic. So um, the, you know, they do twin studies where, for instance, you know, two people with exactly the same genetic makeup, but they've had two different lifestyles with two different families, for instance, have been adopted. And you see how differently mm. that person, those two people can um, develop and what kind of diseases they may or may not have in the future. So it's the idea of the interplay of genetics, but also with lifestyle and and life experience, um, and so and our attitudes, right? So um, yeah, it's a passion of mine to to unpack how people got into the positions that they're in, and to try and work backwards and mm-hmm. and heal those things. So things like um, fibromyalgia, um, chronic fatigue, um, mm-hmm. you know, these things can always be traced back to digestive discomfort which prevents the production of clean blood um, you know, you end up with pain um, exhaustion base what we call chi dependency in Chinese medicine in a nutshell mm. it's, yeah a lot of it is mindset and how we process emotions too because you hear people saying you can eat the perfect diet you can exercise you can do everything right but if our mo- if we're not processing things correctly emotionally psychologically that that can affect our you know you get pains in your stomach so when you're worried like, right so yeah. then that those uh, excretions affect the way you're going to uh, metabolize your food that's right yeah so with with copious amounts of cortisol running through the body the food is going to go straight through you probably end up with diarrhea it's not mm. going to be absorbing that in the, in the small intestine um, and you can be spending lots of money on organic food yeah. if the person is really highly stressed that digestion is not happening in, yeah. in the correct way um, we're working on the working on mindfulness, mm-hmm. on the staying calm, mm-hmm. practicing yoga, tai chi, qigong, yeah, being yoga, um, yeah. going out into nature, um, being able to release those difficult emotions, um, mm-hmm. getting therapy, things like that are all going to be really important to the general well-being of the patient. Mm. You would hear people saying that get into nature more and go hiking and just get away from being indoors. Sometimes on weekends we want to just stay indoors and ch- you know watch some TV or relax, but they say get out in nature. You know the home there's so much technology in the home too isn't mm-hmm. there like wi-fi and everything mm-hmm. to get into nature to just sort of decompress and breathe extra oxygen yeah. is really important yeah so the way that the body produces chi is from the, the the air that we breathe um and then also the food that we eat and it combines together and in chinese medicine we talk about the feng and the stomach as being sort of like the the energy center where all of that chi is produced mm-hmm. and then that goes on to then make good clean healthy blood yeah um, and that's so being out in nature, plus having good food, plus working on our mindset, is going to help with that process to um, yeah, produce mm. really good, strong blood and contribute to longevity. So people that are anemic, can they um, sort of reverse anemia? I'm wondering, because we hear a lot of people saying that they don't have the food absorption, malabsorption, and they're not, they've got issues with anemia. Can that be sort of treated, sure. maybe not reverse, mm-hmm. but you know, substantially improved? So there are a number of herbal formulas that's always depending on the person as, mm. to, as to what we'll prescribe. Um, there's a number of formulas that are called blood building formulas and they're blood building foods and dietary advice yeah. that they can follow. One of the things that affects the spleen function um, and the ability to create good blood is overthinking, pensiveness and worrying. So what does that do? Um, it, it prevents the spleen from being able to actually produce blood in, in, the, in the most optimum way. So. Um, having to deal like having to work on the mental health 
side of things and overthinking ruminations and stuff mm. like that. It's, it's going to be really important um, for that person to hear their digestive system as well. And another thing that uses a lot of blood, so heavy, but you know, we're always making blood and we're always using blood, but I mean, the liver system uses a lot of blood. So if you give her a study and all that sort of stuff, both the liver and the spleen, mm. um, you know, it can contribute to a lack of a volume of blood that we need. It's not always just, um, so you can't really translate anemia and blood deficiency exactly. Often one goes with the other, but sometimes someone can have you know, good haemoglobin, um, when they're surgeon and things like that. Right. Um, it doesn't always translate exactly, but certainly the health of the digestive system in conjunction with a calm mind um, mm. contributes to much better um, blood production as well. Yeah, right. Interesting. Oh, nice. So I think I think you've covered everything and you gave us uh, your details how to contact you. And anything else you want to share before we wrap it up? Try acupuncture. Try If you haven't tried it, Try it before you get really unwell. Exactly. So try it before it you get yeah, unwell. Yeah, try acupuncture to, when you have something niggling. So one thing yeah, that we sort of spoke about is um, women's health and period pain. Mm. Period pain is common, but it's not normal. Mm. And so it's a good idea, especially with young girls, to, to get on top of that before it develops into something like endometriosis or fibroids or um, PCOS or Bridge Bell or um, polycystic ovary syndrome and things mm. like that. So if there's pain in the pelvis, Certainly, it's good to, to nip that in the bud in mm. those early stages. Um, and acupuncture and herbs, brilliant for that kind of thing. Brilliant for fertility, pregnancy, sexual work, postpartum, menopause. It's uh, had a very good track record for all these women's health. So mm. I do encourage women to, to, to deal with these things as they arise when they're um, before they turn into anything major. Yeah. Mm. Excellent. Atira, thank you so much for joining and sharing. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Atira.